Good evening, everyone. We are live. Hi, this is Daniel Ingram, and you are listening to Brony Debates. Indeed, we are, we are well, most of us are, are bronies, and we're going to be doing a little bit of debating tonight. I hope you're all doing well out there on this eve of Easter uh, for, you know, my friends out there that are celebrating Easter, if any. So, yeah, tonight we've got a, a topic that I've been looking forward to for a long time. Uh, scheduling conflicts aside, we're here now and I'm loving it. So children's music and its purpose. And for that, we brought on Mr. Daniel Ingram from, uh, I mean, probably uh, several hundred shows. Didn't, didn't I hear that you were going for a world record for compositions, Mr. Ingram? I mean, I don't know if there is a an actual, like, recorded world record for the for the specific thing I had in mind, but yeah. I thought how many people like have written so like songs specifically that are on TV or on, like, I know there have been people who've written thousands of songs, you know, do they, they just write a new song every day for themselves, but to specifically have them as commissions, like on television, all at one, you know, at one time, I wondered yeah. what the world record is kind of hard to quantify, but I know that, I'll be hitting about a thousand probably in the next two years. So that's where I was. Uh, two that's or three insane. Years. I couldn't even it's list a thousand yeah. songs. I don't have a thousand songs yeah. on, on my iPad. So we, but we know yeah, him best. From the, yours truly, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, we know Daniel Ingram best for his work on friendship is magic for which we are incredibly uh, grateful for. Uh, we've also got, as you've been here and we got cruiser Brony joining us again. How you doing tonight, sir? Doing very good. Uh, got a chance to hit the gym today, and then after this, I'm going to go see the new Ghostbusters. Very good. Uh, the, oh, there's a new Ghostbusters. Mm -hmm. Frozen I, Empire. I had uh, Frozen Empire. Isn't that where King Sombra came from? No, I think that's where the people who went to see the Titanic went. Oh, geez, that's a, that's even worse. We're getting we're getting dark already. Uh, we've got Forever Free Brony joining us again. How you doing tonight, Goonie? I'm doing great. Just had a breakfast of champions, you know. I mean, like, I that's that's the most recent thing that I did, but like, a breakfast I, of champions. The day, the day was just kind of dro droning on, yeah. Eggs Benedict, tomorrow's my birthday, so my wife treated me out. Oh, okay, okay. So, well, happy birthday, and uh, happy birthday, you and yeah. I have two very different definitions of breakfast of champions, so I'm grateful for that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was like, goodness, uh, we're out here on the implication show already, so um. Let's let's talk a little bit about about the topic here. So, uh, generally, yeah, I was very interested in your perspective, uh, Daniel, on what children's music serves as a. It, what is the purpose of children's music, as somebody who's composed a lot of this? Because yeah, when we uh, when we initially posed this topic to you, you were working on Treebies, and I did take a listen to that. And it was it was still really good music, but it was a lot of like what we what we would expect. So, I'm interested in in your perspective on that, and we'll go from there. Sure. I mean, it's a complicated question because children is a very broad top, a very broad um, depth term. term. Okay. So, for example, like when I work with clients in television. You know, they actually subdivide like children's and family into like several subcategories. So you've got your like what they say two to four, you know, per shows, like shows that are geared for two to four, like even like Bluey would say be in that category. Um, but Peppa Pig, you know, you know, are popular ones. Um, Coco Melon would be that even younger. Um, and then you have your kind of six to nine. Uh, range of children's which is sort of where my little pony was aimed and um and then you've got your kind of nine to 12 or 13 uh which might be more like high school musical or something like that um so you know the children's isn't just simply like they don't nobody expects music for children to appeal to every kid from age one to age 12. i mean there's going to be a giant discrepancy in the taste of those kids. And so um, I think as a parent now, now I have a four and a half year old, um, I could say it's been very interesting to watch the evolution of his interest uh, in music. 
And I, ha I noticed that when he was really young, we couldn't get him to listen to the music I would listen to as an adult. Like I couldn't actually get them interest him interested in really, in his case, in listening to the Beatles or listening to pop music or, or anything, even classical music. He just wanted to listen to kids' music. What, you know, specific music that seemed to appeal to him was clearly written for young children, like babies and early childhood kids. So I would just start that answering that big question by just saying there are a lot of kids uh, uh, throughout that age range that really won't listen to much other than children's music. So it's important that the music that they will end up um, kind of gravitating to hopefully be of high quality and educational or impart some kind of purpose uh, in their development. Um, be it just fun, playing with the family, bonding with their parents, bonding with their siblings, bonding with their friends um, is like high up on that list. Uh, you know, or maybe even like learning a few things. So that's that's why I'd say the, the broad answer to that question of the importance of children music is kids need it. You know, they really a lot of kids won't just listen to anything else. Now, that's that's really interesting uh, that your son didn't want to listen to uh, probably my, what I might describe as as normal music, because mm -hmm. um, as I was telling you right before the stream, we didn't really have kids music in my house when when I was growing up. Uh, we were listening to uh, everything from the 1970s and 80s, which was when my parents were, uh, you know, were my age really, and so they're they're you know, uh, it, and I'll tell you, I'll regale the story again. I was talking to my older sister uh, some years ago, and she was complaining about how she you know feels the need to listen to Wheels on the Bus whenever she takes a road trip with her young boys, and it, it's driving her nuts. And I was wondering why she needed to bother because, you know, we, we listened to normal music that really anybody could listen to when, when we were growing up. Now, granted, uh, it, probably a six-year-old should not understand the implications of the lyrics of most ACDC music <laughs> or, or Guns N' Roses or, or Kiss or, or things of that nature. But we had a lot of ABBA and we had a lot of Monkees and Beatles and all the animal bands from the 1960s, things of that nature. Uh, so, um, but it never... I always, uh, even as an educator, was sort of under the impression that, that kids will take what you give them so if you listen to music then that's it, the music they listen to is the music that you listen to so that's that's interesting to me and he would spit your son would specifically ask for things that were geared more yeah. low, uh, younger yeah and i'm gonna i'll say like one caveat is now that he's four and a half and he's in hip-hop dance classes and stuff like now he listens to like dua lipa like on and and lizzo on like repeat <laughs> but certainly when he was younger if we put on that music in the car for example he would literally just be like no 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 i don't want to hear that no 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 and like he would get upset and he would ask specifically for whatever he was into in that time and he had a quite a broad range of music he was listening to but whether it was like the wiggles or um you know, these some of these Japanese artists that we like putting on. Uh, it was always stuff that was kind of like clearly for young kids that he he would request or expect to hear. And we had a really hard time. And it would, too, it'd drive us crazy as parents going like, oh, we just want to listen to what we want to listen to. But he would have none of it. Like, he absolutely would not let us put that music on. That, that's crazy. So, yeah, and That's... then um, and then I and then I started Treebees, which is why I kind of started Treebees, um, for for a number of reasons. And mm -hmm. one of them was and just just so our listeners or no, like Treebees is this kind of um, YouTube IP I I wanted to create where I wrote you know I wrote originally about fifty percent original songs and used a lot of wheels on the bus and like traditional um, nursery public rhymes. Public domain. Yeah, public domain songs and combined them and created a catalog of maybe seventy or eighty songs. Um, that I kind of thought, well, this at least if we're going to put this on and that he likes it, you know, we don't hate it. You know, we kind of like it, too. So um, the idea was to kind of try to bridge that gap a little bit better between what uh, parents can stomach and what kids enjoy um, when they won't listen to music geared to adult for more for like a broader adult audience. OK. Um, 
Anyhow, but yeah, he, he kind of took him to about age three to get out of that phase for us. So I noticed that, and I noticed um, some of these artists in children's, like say a Rafi or the Wiggles. Wiggles have been around 20 years. Rafi's, um, you know, his famous song, like Baby Beluga, has celebrated its 40th anniversary. So this a lot of these songs are like very enduring and very universal around the for i wouldn't say around the world but definitely for a broad audience um nursery rhymes some 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 do really play around the world um for for kids all over the world uh, up to a up to you know a certain age when they really start to move on but we saw from my little pony that a lot of i just recently heard from a friend of mine you know their daughter's six and she's still obsessed she's currently very obsessed with generation four and generation five my little pony songs um good kid yeah and so my son now is not interested in that like he moved he quickly now only listens to like i would say like adult radio music um but uh a lot of kids will even in their six six seven eight nine still like do love the music that or in the shows they love right so whether that's my little pony or Equestria Girls are, are obviously numerous, numerous, numerous um, children's shows. Okay, so um, let's hear from, you know, the rest of the panel and get some, get some thoughts here for a second. Uh, Cruiser, what do you think about all this? Well, the other thing, too, and I think Goonie can agree with me on this one, is that when you become a musician in any capacity, you can appreciate music on a different level as far as writing goes. Like, if I were to put on thunderstruck by acdc going back to them uh the leads on that thing are incredible the fact that angus young can actually pull those off those hammer on pull offs i can't get that at all but a, a child is not going to understand that complexity they're just going to hear those notes they're not going to think about what it took to write that and what it takes to pull off so if you try playing that kind of stuff for a kid they're not going to get it I mean, kids respond to energy in music, you know, they do respond to melody, but a lot of times it's just the energy. And if they like ACDC, even the young kids, they will, you know, want to just hear like, I think it's more like the drums and the chord changes, but they, yeah, they, they're not appreciating it on a, almost like if you're listening to something like Frank Zappa, you might be like, okay, like, that's just, you, you really can appreciate it on an intellectual level. It's so technical and so weird, you know, in a lot of cases. Whereas, like, that might be just too much for them to hear all of that. And it just might be like, okay, this is overwhelming. And so as a young child's mind is developing, often they will gravitate to something more simple. ACDC does have some, you know, I think kids can listen to Back in Black from a pretty young age, <laughs> you know, if, they're, if they want to just party, right? Yeah. Um, it's the classic. Yeah. It's the classic. <laughs> but they're not appreciating it, say, on the level like a musician would, where it's like, oh, they're looking at the technical side if you're a guitarist or the the chord changes if you're maybe like a songwriter i have a different perspective actually i mean not like su super different but i have a different perspective on uh where some children mu children's music comes from i i happen to be uh uh part of uh, the the lds or mormon church and my calling in the church is primary teacher and so i teach little kids but i'm also the primary pianist and so i play songs that are specifically geared towards children and they're meant to you know teach about jesus and they're all also but they're also meant to be fun in some ways like some songs are geared towards like getting all your wiggles out and some songs are uh geared towards like you know learning a certain uh, learning a certain concept you know yeah. or or something like that and so in my eyes i guess a lot of a lot of children's music in that sense is also just geared towards teaching, you know, and, and, and having fun. Totally. When I write, when I'm, again, when I'm writing for kids, I would, children, I would say it really does depend on the age range, like whether it's one of those three major age range. But if I'm looking at what you're talking about, um, Goonie, like really young, um, you know, two, one to four, uh, I'm looking more now when I write that music, I'm looking more towards like, how can we be interactive? Like right. kids, kids see music 
is a way to engage and be interact and be interactive. And this is something that gets a little bit lost with YouTube, um, but we certainly have it in like con back in in certain other countries like Australia, where they have a lot of touring children's groups. Um, and so now I as I look at it as okay, how can you make those like circle time songs like with wheel? The reason like Wheels on the Bus is so enduring is it's like the yeah. wheels on the bus go. Around. You know, like kids can do this. So Correct. the yeah. doors yeah. on the bus go open and shut. You know, there's so many of those young kids songs are really just meant to help children develop the vocabulary by engaging them through, through melody, which is a really strong way to develop early language development, but also interact with their community, whether that be in a church community or their friends or their parents and like do those activities and it's a way to bond. I mean, there's a lot of value in all of that where it's not really about the quality of the music or how sophisticated the music is. It's the 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 value comes more in how well will this um, draw this child in and get them to engage with their elders and their peers and have a shared experience and, and learn something through that physical movement or whatever it might be. Um, and that's where that's where I find the challenges because I'm always wanting to go. Well, I don't want to write something that's so dumb, <laughs> you know, it's so simplistic that you want to shoot yourself in the head. But at the same time, um, you want to like not overcomplicate it and distract from the primary goal, which is to just engage that child in that music and get them interested in music and get them interested in 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 that in that interactive experience. Indeed. So, uh, Daniel, we were also hoping to hear about uh, some of the newer projects you were working on, and one of them is uh, is Billy Bust Up, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Cool. I mean, what it's can you new. tell us about that? Well, yeah, I know it's been, been around for. We've it actually, as a matter of fact, my wife uh, follows uh, Billy Bust Up has has been looking forward to to the full uh, release of it. Uh, so yeah, and uh, she actually had some questions for you that she gave me to ask to pass on before the show. We'll get to them later, but you know, sure. tell me tell me a little bit more about the projects you're working on now and how that sort of relates to uh, tonight's topic or things like treebies or uh, what what can you tell us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so speaking of age demographics, Billy Bust Up is definitely in this very unique. Um, well, this it's more like the Disney category where you're going, okay, these songs really have to appeal to adults, but they also have to not alienate children. They can't be like, uh, you know, they have to still be very PG and fun. And so, you know, when you look at a movie like Moana or something, like this is what they're going for. Like, how do we get the parents to love the music, the teenagers to love the music, and the little kids to love the music, or or Frozen or, or whatever. So Billy Bust Up isn't that category so it's not so much children's as much as it is family like everybody um the game itself they reached out to me katie and ash the developers i feel like maybe four years ago now and they said hey we're developing this game it's very early on we think it would be really cool to have these big epic set piece songs like not just like one minute but four minutes to I think like the longest is like 13 minutes. <laughs> you know, these giant songs that can have looping sections and that can kind of go in different directions depending on the gameplay and have them as an interactive gameplay component, whether it be a boss battle or a chase sequence or, 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 or a training sequence, whatever, um, and really carve new ground because it hasn't really been done to this extent that I'm aware of, um, by having a game that has many songs that work within the structure of the game to, um, you know, ex expand on the gameplay experience, not just be a, something you listen to in a cutscene, but like literally like you play that song, like you play your character as that song plays and you work and you interact with it, with the rhythm, uh, with the pacing, um, and you can't get to the end of the song unless you perform in the game well. So if you like 
your character gets uh you know defeated during the song like the song ends you know and you have to start again so anyway so that was the that was the concept and i said wow it sounds like a huge challenge but really amazing so let's uh let's try it so they just told me you know the broad parameters of one of the scenes in the in the game and said we need a song that's going to work with this sequence and uh, that was a song that is currently out on spotify um where this character fantokio is kind of a pinocchio type um, ma magical character has decided that he has had enough of this lead character billy from Bill from the name billy bust up and wants her basically to she's so rebellious like he's so sick of her being so rebellious because she's always trying to in the game at this point i think kind of sabotage him um he's so tired of that he's decided i am going to turn you into my puppet and put you on strings and i'm going to control everything you do from now on and the song plays and the whole time you're trying to escape him trying to make you into a puppet um and ultimately defeat him so anyways that was the first song i wrote for the game probably three or four years ago and um, and since then, the game has really developed many. We've gone through fundraising. They've gone through getting publishers, um, bringing in a big team. The game is due to come out, I think, in about a year. Um, I can't say for sure. I don't want to really spoil that. I don't really know. But I know it's very close to finishing development. All the songs are written now. And um, I can also say, I think there's like 14 songs I wrote for that game. And, uh, and yeah, that, that's been going on for the last four years. Now, you, and you just started a uh, campaign too to make an orchestral version of the soundtrack? Yeah, so basically we released two songs on Spotify um, to help promote the game. And those two songs, to our absolute surprise, uh, gained you know millions of streams, like 10 million streams on Spotify, wow. millions of streams on YouTube, um, like, like a, a shocking amount of success because I don't know if you know this, but you know Spotify gets like I don't know like six thousand submissions a day. You know, like there's so many songs <laughs> that come out, and so to see these two songs suddenly blow up and gain you know about 150,000 monthly listeners on average, we were like, this is nuts. Maybe this game is going to do really well. Maybe this music will do well. Why don't we see if we can absolutely push the limit on how good it can be? And the this the way to do that I said initially to them was we got it, we need to replace this like MIDI synth big band on these five songs where it's very like ba da ba ba da ba ba da ba da ba da ba you know like big bandy energy crazy wild stuff that just doesn't sound that good on synths and I mm. said we need to hire like a real big band and absolutely blow it out and have it sound like you know. Um, you know, is, is authentic, I kind of like, kind of, if you think like The Incredibles or something like that, uh, like that kind of soundtrack. And um, they were like, sure, well, how much money do we need? And I said, well, we need this much for the big band. And they go, what if we raise more than that? And I said, well, why don't we also put a stretch goal to raise enough to record a full orchestra on all the songs? Because all the songs have like a live, like an orchestral component that we I use with synth, synth, synth to do. And so we threw it in as a stretch goal. Uh, we launched the campaign about three weeks, less than three weeks ago. And we very quickly, I think in the first day, hit the big band goal. So we're already moving ahead to book a big band. We've got a, a, a Grammy winning recording engineer who's gonna record that. And um, it's gonna be amazing. And we're very close now. I think we're about 10,000 pounds away from raising enough money to go to Nashville, hire a 70, 80 piece orchestra and record all the songs in the game with live orchestra, which are just going to take it from being, you know, video game synth, you know, video gamey, like a little bit on the cheaper side sounding to like absolutely Disney level pro sounding. Uh, so we're really excited about that. I, I just hope we hit that goal. So um, we're close and I think it's going to really make it worth it. They're no. making a lot of, yeah, very good uh, incentives as well. Now, Chet, if you it's if impressive. you hear that, yeah, if you hear that and you're interested in, at all in supporting that, at the very top of the description is the link to the to the um, campaign. I can talk. I went to college. <laughs> the link to the campaign where you can go support that and and see what you get in return. Is that is that true? 
Yeah, there's about 15 things on offer and the sort of the, the biggest one, which is quite a lot of money. <laughs> is and now to here's, come here's to what the, you, here's what you need to, to do, the, right? We're going to take that stretch goal and we're going to have like on the upper end of the stretch goal, we're going to hire uh, Bronny Buck as a musician on there. He's going to come on. That guy can rip a triangle like you wouldn't believe. Like, hey, you know what? One of the stretch goals, which we have not announced, but I, we, I'm going to tease it here, is that if we actually surpass our minimum goal for the orchestra, one of the stretch goals is to actually release a remix album where I'll, I'll give someone like Bronny, um, sorry, not Bronny, but I, um, uh, Goonie, all, all the stems of the music and do like a whole album of remixes where we hire members of the music community and the fans of the game to actually release tracks on Spotify through the Billy Bust Up channel and uh, receive, um, you know, a split on the back end, but also, and get paid to do it. So we are, as soon as we hit our goal for orchestra, we are planning on giving back and hiring people to do remixes and stuff too. So that's, uh, and we can, we can, uh, that reminds me about Goonie here. Cause, uh, sir, you've done music for games before, haven't you Goonie? Uh, like, didn't you do a few songs for the, uh, for the ambient white game? Yeah. Sadly, <laughs> none of the games that I have ever participated in have ever been released. I mean, I think there's been like a couple public demos, or whatever and they've been on like kickstarter or 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 something like that i may and possibly patreon but um the first game that i ever got uh um basically hot i guess you know it was kind of more of a tryout for me at that point and so i i i wanted to i wanted to do something to see if it was it, it was in my in my in my I don't know, within my abilities, you know, to do something. And that was Ambient White. And uh, the first song I ever made uh, turned out to be extremely, extremely popular. And this is, of course, four years after the song was made. And they said, hey, uh, we're going to delay the game by like another four years. So <laughs> go ahead and release the song. <laughs> so anyways, uh, yeah. Um, that was one, that was that song ambience or what is it one of the uh yeah, piano song was ambience yeah that song was ambience it is it is by far one of my one of my most um one of my quickest uh view gaining songs you know it's on youtube at least it's it's pretty popular on my channel well to give cool. some perspective um, for uh for daniel real quick here because i don't know how well you keep up with the brony fan but ambient white is this is this really ni nicely visually made um game that and there is a playable demo out there i believe i've been meaning to play it myself uh like hack and slash of of uh princess luna and you can like fire spells and and things like that and it's kind of a, a winter uh winter sort of time uh or uh, not time frame sort of setting here and uh Goonie made this song called uh ambience and and i believe you did a few other uh piano tracks for like the background of it right i did one more for that game yeah it's uh for the for like an opening credit scene yeah uh, ambience happens to be the end credit scene <laughs> so oh, i made okay. two songs for the very beginning and the end uh, so so after the show, I've got to we got to show you this song. It's it, me personally. That song hits me right where I live. So I gotta be I gotta be very careful when I listen to that song. Did, but uh, yeah, it's an extremely good song. So so Goonie, do you uh, is is the music making process for a game uh, any different from from your normal process? Very. Very, very, very. Yeah. Um, my normal process is that, you know, I come up with everything and I come up with, you know, the concepts and things that I things that I want to put in the in into my project. Whereas when I make uh, when I make video game music, it typically, especially if it's like a, a much more indie developer, um, they have a vision for for what they want. And it's not my vision. So I have to I have to really, really uh, humble myself and uh, kind of hunker down and listen to what they want and take critiques and take, um, you know, all the kinds of things that they're hoping for and making making sure that that I am contributing in that in that way so that they so that they are satisfied with the song, you know, and, and that's that was definitely the process with ambience. It was 
like without a doubt that song went through multiple versions before it finally came to that you know final version and i'm glad it did i i wish it didn't have to be so in, in, and sometimes it's different where you where the developer is satisfied you know immediately like with what you made and sometimes they're a little bit more picky but but yeah the that's interesting because that's the yeah. opposite of my experience with gaming versus tv <laughs> right yeah so how does it well, like in television you, well, I was going to say with the television, it's like what you're saying, Goonie, with me, they have a script, they have a very specific story in mind, they have a very specific, sometimes to the point where they say, here, here's these reference songs, we want it to sound like one of these, you know, whereas with the game, with Billy Bust Up specifically, people are kind of like, uh, they, sorry, the, the, the game developers were like, this is what we kind of where the gameplay starts can you fill in like the rest and i and i was able to help come up with the gameplay come up with all the lyrics come up with the some of the story arc you know like i feel like i actually had way more from what i'm used to in television i had a lot more creative freedom in gaming than i had than i have typically in tv but that's just sort of i guess that's the difference when you're doing your own thing entirely versus working with a client yeah it was it was definitely i mean like typically the video game music is not going to have lyrics and my song had lyrics and so that was mostly the thing that that they wanted changed a lot mm -hmm. yeah so yeah so yeah and i and i in typically in television they often have a script and they will f at least half the time have lyrics already and then i kind of have to like make those lyrics work whereas with this game they had they had no lyrics and it was like hey and that was and they ended up probably the first month of the songwriting process was us sharing a Google Doc and me, the, you know, them watching as I wrote the lyrics <laughs> over the course of like weeks and kind of com commenting, con you know, like, oh, we love this, or, you know, what in, or we don't like this or whatever. And I sort of wrote all the lyrics before the song was written or played in anyway, even though I had an idea in my head. And, um, and then, and so that lyric, lyric, feedback process uh was a lot more intensive for me in the in development of billy bust up uh whereas in television like it's usually the songs are really short and there's usually already lyrics and it's a lot um simpler interesting, yeah. interesting. And oh, it the, the instrumental part was the easiest for me because mm -hmm. like they were i'd never done anything ambient and they and to go along with the theme of the game they wanted very very ambient music uh, you know, ambient style, like it's, it's just, it's slow and, and it's, uh, you know, it's relaxing, something you imagine reading a book to or falling asleep to or whatever, where, except they also want lyrics with it. And so they said, Hey, so since you've never done any ambient music, like we got a bunch of other musicians on the team, uh, who are used to it. And if you need any help, just let them know. And I got it on my first try. I didn't need any help. That was the easiest part. I did ambient music, it was great. But like the lyrics were just, it was just like, I sent them this version. I was like, okay, how does this kind of sum it up? He's like, eh, and then I, and then I kind of rewrote them again. And then it was just, it was a lot of, it was a lot of, you know, it was just me. It was just, it was a very, very small team. It was just basically me talking directly with the developer of the game. And yeah. it was just, so, yeah. Yeah, lyrics, I think are the hardest, most time consuming part of the songwriting process, personally. Mm -hmm. If they give me lyrics, I can write a song in a day, no problem. If I have to write the lyrics, it could be weeks. <laughs> it could be weeks. I feel, so, I feel that. Uh, <laughs> I feel that. It's so hard. Uh, oh, I, I can't. Uh, I'm not as musically inclined as the rest of my family is. I've only uh, written one song. It was, and it was, even that, it was a, it was a parody. And when I went and when I sat down to write the lyrics for that song, I had the lyrics in about 10 minutes and all I did was and all I did was tell a story and then I had to go over it a couple more times to make sure it rhymed and was on beat. But uh so um but I I I don't know. I know very little about music, so that that's just uh that's just my very limited experience right there. So when um Here's a here's a question uh, for you guys that I'm that I'm sort of curious about. Uh, do you find the impact any different if you're working with uh, real analog instruments versus something uh, digital? And in the especially in the terms of like 
uh, kids' music or music that kids are going to be listening to, do you feel like it has a, an effect on how they receive the music if it's digitally produced versus uh, analog or, or with a live band or um, or techno, just techno in general, like like uh, like dubstep, something artificial? I, I hopefully I'm making sense here. Yeah, I don't I don't think there's any hierarchy in terms of one is better than the other. Like electronic music serves its purpose, acoustic instruments serve their purpose. Like there's no, I would never say like, oh, acoustic is better than electronic or something like that. Like definitely um, everything has its its purpose. And I think as long as it's sincere, kids or whoever's listening will, will be able to respond, you know, to it um, based on how like it, much it makes sense. But I will say that if you're trying to make acoustic instruments with synthetic instruments, there it's like less real now sometimes that's a sound sometimes that's cool like if it's supposed to sound kind of 90s or something but typically um the only place i would say oh people's ears will or people will respond better is when you're you know faking when you, when you can when you can you know pick a lane and do it in an authentic way so for example on billy bust up one of the songs we recently released called the pirate queen's cave had loot in the beginning and it was midi loot that we you know i just and listened to that song like... right before we went live it's a really good one. Oh yeah thanks so there's actually yeah there's several versions of that song we released one but there's actually many versions depending on how the gameplay works but anyway um the um we re we originally did it with midi loot and it was like okay and then we just hired a loot player and did it with live loot and the live loot sounded just so much warmer and more authentic so in that case i would say it makes sense to use a, acoustic instruments but if you're going to write an entire soundtrack like i don't know if you're henry jackman or something and you're doing like a lot of synths it can sound amazing and it can, and you don't want live instruments to do that so i definitely feel like everything has its place and uh kids will people will respond to whatever their taste is interesting um cruiser what do you i haven't heard from you in a little bit what would you like to add or take away anything from what we've been talking about well it kind of depends like if you're musically inclined like the three three of us here and there's like a a particular style you want to try to you know, correlate your kids to then because i know there's still there are some people who prefer you know acoustic or digital or analog vice versa so if you want them to gravitate towards that you're going to have to you know start them early you gotta just show you know you're going to be listening to this and not the other but do i think a child but do i think a child is really going to care or you know one way or the other if we're talking about something like what daniel did with tree bees uh probably not <laughs> uh, I don't think they're. Uh, I really think uh, once you get older and you start t training your uh, the kid's ear, then perhaps it will have a bigger impact on them. Mm -hmm. So it really kind of depends on what age you're going for. So if we're talking just like kids, I'm pretty sure they won't mind. But if we're talking like teenagers and up, it it probably might. And also, it kind of depends on what culturally is going on too, because there was that big boom that happened with dubstep. Uh, nobody saw that coming, and yet it got huge. It got enormous. Uh, it's calmed down a little bit, but I guarantee you that had a lot of influence on people because everybody gra gravitated towards it so much. Yeah, and now I'm noticing with some of the artists that are popular currently, I don't know whether it's Taylor Swift or like, like in pop or like Dua Lipa. Like Dua Lipa's thing, it's all like, it's all like almost going back to the 90s kind of like um f or even like 70s in some influences where it's like very funk driven you know and it's like mm. live bass and live big band and live but there's an electronic component and it's almost like now you kind of always expect to hear a certain electronic component mixed with um you know mixed with live instruments that do like you know you can't do funk only in synth it sounds really stupid but like you could do funk with a mix of synth and live you know and that's mm -hmm. and that's what i'm noticing is where things have kind of 
con all the styles kind of come together and you kind of get used to hearing all elements mixed. Um, but you have to have a mastery of both the synthetic side of things as well as the live side of things to be able to pull it off. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Goonie, do you have any thoughts a on the experience? Yeah. Yeah, actually, I was going to I was going to say I have a little experience experience on um combining the two uh combining a synthetic sound versus you know a uh, uh or a synthesized sound rather and uh with a with an actual live sound of the of the same instrument um there, there's a song that i wrote called chant of selflessness and this song um it has a basically a full uh a full string section that was recorded by one person or rather a full violin section that was recorded by one person i asked him to just basically send me like a million takes of this same pattern short little pattern and um for this for this song because i i particularly when i tried it myself when i tried doing this you know just by just with synthesizers just i felt like it felt it sounded too fake and it sounded like it wasn't authentic enough and it was a very you know uh not not like shanty but more like a um more like a um what do you call that kind of marching it was kind of a marching chant kind of a thing is what it was and the pattern itself was and so i really just yeah it's my audio will be breaking up i'm sorry about that um, but um uh but yeah the pattern was kind of it was i felt like that particular pattern needed you know it needed the the support of real instant instruments to to sound more authentic and not like every note is going to sound the same you know and so and it turned out that that was that was the best option for the song um and it it yeah i would say like right now for example with billy bust up we were now that we're going oh we're going to record it with live orchestra now we have to look at um the actual orchestration that we did with midi that worked with midi and not everything with MIDI, even though it sounds like it would work, live will work. And there's definitely things that live players and live, depending on the instrument, can play that MIDI can't. And so we're actually having to reorchestrate the songs to go, okay, this worked with synth instruments, like synth orchestra. Now it won't work with live and vice versa. So I know what you mean. Like you have to write for the medium you're using like you have to write if you and if you have a specific melody in mind that has to be played a certain way it might not work in synth world or in midi world it might have to be played and it might not work on guitar but sound really good on saxophone like you just it really depends right. on um whether you're going to put the melody first or whether you're going to write for the instrument first and uh unfortunately in television the budget's office usually pretty small we can't usually write like record live instruments for everything so you're always going okay how can i compromise and write something that will be sound authentic using a all done in the computer versus um you know where we go oh now we have live players now we're gonna I, honestly i would always approach it differently when i knew i had live players right. yeah one thing that i see that it's kind of on a similar uh uh uh, on a similar strand here is in the concert scene i keep hearing about this whole thing about uh uh backing tracks or non-backing tracks which is better and a lot of people tend to look down on musicians who use backing tracks and as this one artist i listened to recently he said it's 2024 we can't afford to pay an entire orchestra to come on tour with us to play uh, a song here so we're just going to push a button to save money. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. but that's obviously, you know, a concert. I don't know if that's going to happen with Billy Bust Up. Kind of hoping it does, but. I, I uh, don't know if Billy Bust Up would ever go on tour, but who knows? But <laughs> I don't, I doubt it. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess stranger things have happened. Um, one, one joke I, I know made a long mean. time ago on Twitter was, uh, I can't wait for people uh in you know fandom musicians like marcus warner or ratty arc uh orchestral guys to do performances at conventions like everfree northwest or something like that so they can just roll in an 80 piece orchestra and see how that yeah. goes uh, 
I mean, I even think when Hans Zimmer's touring around these days, I don't think he's touring with like an orchestra, you know, like you, you tour with like a 12 musicians or whatever. Um, right. The, but I mean, who knows? I, I don't know. I haven't seen that concert yet coming, I know here, but uh, I doubt even Hans Zimmer, who's like working with massive multi-million dollar budgets with live orchestra, et cetera, you know, on Dune and whatnot, uh, like are, you know, he's using live orchestra for the movie, but I wonder, I think they do a kind of stripped down version for like a live show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, you uh, never does know what can go on tour. You never know. Uh, does anybody have always... anything they want to add or take away uh, before I ask my next question? Um, I thought, or um, I think I just cut you off by accident. I'm sorry, Daniel. Oh, that's okay. I, I was going to say, well, I had this idea with the Treebies and maybe this will work with my new thing of like, what happens if you had a group of singers? Uh, in our case, I have a band. It's like four singers, and they were to tour kids' music to different countries and different or different states and different provinces in North America, say. And in each one they go to, they go to the orchestra that's there. So in Vancouver, we have the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. Every city has an orchestra, mostly in across North America, mm -hmm. and the. Uh, and they have the sheet music and the beauty is, you know, orchestra players just read the sheet music. So they could actually tour four people to all these orchestras around North America and do live kids and do a kid a concert for families. Um, just like they do this with, uh, you know, when the Star Wars tours or when um, they did a Harry Potter tour, like, you know, the film scores do tour. And you just go from city to city with your band and you just play with whatever orchestra is there as opposed to a touring orchestra, you know what I mean? Which is very complex. So it can I be done if you're willing oh, to use the local musicians. I was, I was going to say, I actually have just participated in one, in one of those just, uh, I think, last year. Um, uh, Jenny Oaks Baker was touring with her family of musicians, and she asked a choir that I'm part of, uh, to participate in, uh, you know, the local, the local version, you know, the Washington, I'm in, I'm in the Seattle area. And, where when she performed in Seattle, she asked my choir to help out. So, yeah, yeah, totally, exactly. So you can you can kind of get your touring live group by using the local resources. Absolutely. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So, um, one question that my that my wife had for uh, for Daniel uh, before I went live here was, uh, she wanted to know how kids horror can play into it so in the in the context of like billy bust up which i heard you say towards the beginning was more geared towards teenagers but it's definitely animated and acted in a way that i think is going to end up appealing to kids as well and we've got this uh owl character that's trying to kill the player character uh to turn him yeah. into a ghost so he can come to a party i'm i'm sorry aside from billy i've forgotten everybody's names i'm really bad about that but yeah, uh, so a, a million gruesome ways to die, and it's a fairly gruesome song. It's pretty dang. <laughs> it's in the contents and the in, uh, the contents of the lyrics and the implications are pretty dang metal. It just needs a thrash guitar in there. So how do yeah. you, uh, how do we how do we reconcile? Uh, you know, when we're dealing with kids here, and we expect things to be a little bit less explicit. Well, uh, and and. Uh, less drastic okay. i think is the right word uh when we're yeah. dealing with this with this medium so okay so i again I, I would i would draw a certain line on age again like kids kids that are kind of like four are still barely able to play like i guess they can kind of play switch and they can kind of play you know mario kart you know but they're not going to be able to play billy bust up i don't think at nice four, to see five you years still old. going Brawny. I, Keep up the good work and give naysayers a boot in the head. D. What? Uh, that was a that was a tip we get, <laughs> just got. I'm sorry, I forgot to let you know oh. about that. Um, but yeah, thank you for the thank you for the tip. Uh, that was um, yeah, we just got a tip that from uh, Star Singer said, "Nice to see you. It's still going, Brawny. Keep up the good work and give the naysayers a boot to the head." That's a little bit of a meme okay. for me. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, th uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I didn't expect a tip, so I I forgot to mention it. <laughs> but then, if you hear that beep, that someone just gave me money. <laughs> oh, awesome! Congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think I think Billy Bust Up's gonna be kind of kids like six and up maybe playing it, I would think. But one of the things 
I, I had this uh, friend visit, their daughter was maybe seven at the time, and she was obsessed with this song, and I know it's gotten like 100 million views on YouTube, or more, billion views, I don't know, a lot, and it's called like 100 Ways to Die, I think, or A Million Ways D to Die. Is Anyways, it Dumb Ways to Die? Yeah, Dumb Ways to Die, that's the Dumb one. Ways to Die, so yeah, many yeah, yeah, dumb exactly. ways. Classic. <laughs> massively popular and i'm like okay if a seven year old is this is her favorite song at the time like she's like daniel you gotta see this i love this song so i watched it with her and i'm like okay if a seven year old can be like obsessed with this you know kids at that age i guess can process okay this is just like dying is an abstract concept that they're not super afraid of you know what i mean it's not it's not meant to be like so realistic as long as we make it fun somehow you know and so in that case they said like dumb ways to die and it's kind of silly and it's animated really silly in billy bust up he's just really excited because he's gonna throw this party but you can't attend unless you're dead <laughs> like you have to be an afterlife to come to it you have to be mm -hmm. a ghost and he's like hey you gotta come to our party all i gotta do is kill you and you can come and well how do you want to die you know and it's so silly and ridiculous that uh it's it, i wouldn't call it horror you know like i, I think it's like any kid at a a, like at that age range who would be actually playing this game would be able to go okay this is kind of exciting and a little bit scary but it's not like and they're playing like halloween the video game you know what and I mean? around around a halloween time last year we had a discussion uh and my and my wife actually came on to this one because she's a she's a horror fan cruiser's a horror fan we had another guy called uh, that creepy reading on and we were talking about kids in horror and they tend to they tend to gravitate towards the uh, towards gruesome things like that like they, they uh, uh poppy's playtime and five nights at freddy's and and uh the amazing digital circus is going to become one i just know it so the um yeah. so yeah, they tend to they tend to gravitate towards these things. So it's it's interesting to try to find where exactly the line is for for your demographic. And even then, you've got to balance like the culture uh, because uh, some parents out there are crazy and let their let their kids watch anything. Uh, yeah, you know, right. even if it's even if it's our race, you get you get kids knowing as much as the adults sometimes, and I don't think that's right. Uh, but totally. Then, yeah, I mean, that's very subjective, right? That comes down to yeah. a parent's choice. But I will say that working in television, and particularly working in uh, children's television, depending on even your client, they have a different threshold for what they consider too scary. And so, um, for example, when I, used, when I was working on Martha Speaks in the very beginning of my career, that was for PBS, WGBH, public television. They were like, we did like a scary episode, and it was the music I wrote the whole music and they were like, this is too scary. Dumb it down, dumb it down, dumb it down to the point where I was like, this isn't scary at all. And then like, they were like, good. That's what we want. We want it to be actually not scary, but scary. It was like a really weird threshold, but like I, Halloween but, themed, but not scary. Yeah, It was like, let's just put a little organ going boop, beep, boop, beep, boop, you know, but not like have strings going like, not like psycho, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, it's like where you have to find this like, OK, what's scary, but not too scary for what they perceive as their audience. Um, but I will say this for sure. Kids love getting scared. They love Halloween. They like getting a little bit spooked. They just don't want to be having nightmares. And so we're always trying to think in, in children's television exactly like who is our audience and how can we not go too far? When I did um, to the opposite of that, I did Strawberry Shortcake, uh, the, the whole new Strawberry Shortcake series that's come out. And we did a Halloween episode that came out this year and uh, for Netflix and it's in CG and it's and it's and I remember writing the music and going, this is really scary. Like, I don't think this is really appropriate. And the producers were like, no, make it scarier, more horror, more intense. And they were they were pushing the opposite way. And I'm like, to my ears, this is too far. But they're like, no, no, we want it. We want cares to be my <laughs> kids to be scared, like to feel that 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 fear. So. I will just say that like as a as someone who works for clients mostly like everyone has a different tolerance for what they think children can handle in terms of what scary music sounds like yeah i'm so impressed what you were able to pull off with rainbow rocks because <laughs> as a music geek i heard every single musical reference you pulled on that thing I, <laughs> i'm like i still remember sitting you know what yeah you know, here comes the dazzlings they play their song i'm like 
this is a Marilyn Manson tune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. because because My Little Pony, and particularly Equestria Girls, was aged up. Um, I was able to kind of push that to not really sound so much like kids' music as much as like young adult, you know, kind of range more. And so, yeah, which really opens up the spectrum of what you can do. Um, I would never do the Dazzlings for four-year-olds, you know, or three-year-olds. No, no, no. And I don't think kids that young are that interested in Equestria Girls. So well, it's okay. Like, it almost works out where, like, young kids would just almost protect themselves against that. They just don't really watch stuff. For, I, I found with our son, he just doesn't want to watch something that's geared to an older audience. He just only seems interested in what's kind of he can handle for his age. Now that's really that's really interesting to me because I actually have the opposite experience. Is that um, like for example, um, you know, I've got family uh, that'll put that'll put on My Little Pony stuff for their kids, and they don't consider Equestria Girls to be aged up. So uh, they'll have their five year old watching. The dazzlings. Oh, and, five and, for sure. Yeah, and yeah, and the, sure. it, right, and uh, so they didn't really consider it, it aged up. And you also, I have always been, uh, you know, when I was working, when I was working in education and childcare, I've always been of the mindset that that if you treat your, uh, if you treat the kids more seriously, I guess would be the word for it. I never, I never quite found the words for it, but uh, some people say if you talk to them like adults, they will learn to think like adults. So they, they, uh, they tend to become more like what you feed into them, which is entirely up to us as the, as the caregivers. So that, uh, that's how we were, you know, that's how we had really no problem handling uh, music that you might consider uh, adult when I was a kid, um, that's how uh, yeah. we get, and, and, but then you go too far. You can go too far. If you get kids like listening to like, uh, like if you're putting on Eminem for your kids, I think you're doing something wrong. But I certainly had friends that listened to, to listen to things of that nature. Uh, when I was, when we were too young to be listening to things <laughs> of that nature. Um, Don, when it comes to, when it comes to the, I'm going to tie this into looping back to when we were talking about like scary things for kids. And Don Bluth was of the mindset that you actually want to have it be a little bit genuinely scary, scary for the kids. You, we want that little bit of controlled trauma so that at this age they can learn to deal with it uh, and learn how to process they sort of so that when uh, they're older and the stakes are higher and things are more rare they're better mentally equipped to be able to to be able to process it better without uh, completely shutting down or being or being even more traumatized so you basically you, you give them a you give them a little psychological injury when they're young and can recover from it and that way they they're they're more toughened up and and I know this is this is uh, the, the implications of what I'm saying here are, are, are horrible but there's a, there's a point to it right uh, like the land before time went pretty dang hard in terms uh -huh. of uh, in terms of that that Tyrannosaurus Rex going after the Brontosaurus, right? So I think... Yeah, or even Grimm's fairy tales are, like, super, like, weird and dark, you know? And well, like, those were made you know, by a German, and, and uh, that's a... So that explains that. <laughs> well, okay, I'll say this. How about every Disney movie almost ever made starts with the parents dying, you know? And it's kind of like, yeah. okay, let's, oh, yeah. let's hit kids at their biggest fear. Let's take away a parent or take away their parents. And it's like... 90% of Disney movies start with the parents dying. And like that to me is a little bit of that same manipulation. It's like, let's, I think in their case, they're just trying to capture a kid's attention by scaring them with, with the thing that at their core, they'd be the most afraid to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but because it's like pretty and it's animated, you know, you, you can kind of tolerate it. Uh, and it's meant to kind of encourage a certain independence ultimately. But like, there's definitely like the industry will manipulate children's fear to engage them as well. And yeah. whether you do that for your, for the, to help them process trauma or whether you help that you do that to engage them for profit is, is a, a whole nother debate. 
Now the the uh, the crux of my the crux of my question here, uh, and I'd like to hear everybody's thoughts on this, is: Do we? Why not? Okay, so I gave the Don Bluth uh, reference. Why don't we do that for music? And that's that's sort of where I come from. The idea of of. Uh, does it need to be specifically for children and does it need to be i mean aside from aside from uh gangster rap and uh, uh you know really heavy like disturbed or or uh, uh corn or things like that i can understand why you wouldn't want your kids listening to that but aside from like composition and in terms of like composition things like that how do we uh do we need to do that just because it's uh, change it just because it's for kids uh, a lot of people say that, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily uh, sure if it's 100 percent true myself, but I, you do hear all the time, hey, make have your kids listen to classical music because the complexity of that will stimulate their brain and help uh, develop the sections of the brain that are more geared towards problem solving and uh, critical thinking and things of that nature. So, yeah, I mean, I would say like with classical music, you know, a kid will, you can put on classical music and they might have it in the background and kind of do their thing. But kids are, I don't think like every kid's different in part to, and again, the word kids is a very big development spectrum. Uh, I don't think they're going to be particularly engaged by it. You know, it's more like something they tolerate. Um, whereas if you're, when they get engaged and you see like kids who like why Coco Melon is like a $2 billion IP is like, you know, you see kids in really engaged in a kind of scary way with the song, say playing on the screen, that's a different type of music than, you know, and, and so that's the, that's the and problem. I, I, like, I would like to touch on Coco Melon just for a second here, because I'd, the Coco Melon scares the heck out of me as an educator because I, it, from what I see it doing, is the opposite of what I was describing before. That is yeah. shutting the brain off, and and I see too many. And I'm, you know, I'm going to be that. I'm going to be that boomer right now. I see too many people putting their kids in front of the electronic babysitter. And uh, yeah. their brain is shut off for too long, just letting it on autoplay. These things that do not stimulate, that do not educate, that do nothing for you. And that is, uh, in, in like, not directly, but certainly, not directly damaging, but certainly not helping the development. And the development is something I, I care about a great deal. Uh, so totally. that, that's, so that's. That's what the implication that I when I hear things like and I yell at people all the time on on in the chat in the chat section of my show here because they'll they'll say something like it's for kids don't worry about it no 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 just because it's for kids doesn't mean it needs to be bad if anything because it's for kids we should be putting our our best effort into uh, having it help them as much as possible so uh, yeah not to mention it looks but ugly. <laughs> I mean, Cocomelon is a whole other conversation. It's definitely, it's, they, they've, they've approached me before, um, but basically they would argue that it's educational because they're like singing about something that's like a, some rudimentary level educational. <laughs> but I agree with you. I think what it, reality is it does end up just like kids like zoning out and watching too much screen time, which is why a lot of public television doesn't start, like they don't, ever will never say that public television is geared for anything under two like they say that it's almost unconscionable for any parent under two to have your kid watching a screen the reality is millions and millions of parents around the world are letting kids of course watch screen time under two years old um and and whether that stunts their development or not depends on you know your that's a you know your stance on that but i agree because so many it's a necessary because it's this sort of thing that just happens that shouldn't happen like that you say the, the digital babysitter comes on and coco melon comes on it puts people like myself who's writing f in these various genres for kids of different ages and it made that's why i did trebies and that's why i'm doing my new project with the live action kids group um was like yeah okay kids will be engaged by stuff for kids so how can we make that not so dumbed down like where is that line how can we make it like 
better for them so that they at least interact you know trebies was really interesting to me because it, it I'm going to agree with you. You you managed to avoid a lot of those uh, a lot of those pitfalls that I that I mentioned. There was a lot of storytelling. There was a lot of uh there were some uh some instances of problem solving. I love the drum song. I unironically love the live action puppets. I, I, I Yeah, but, so I unironically liked the drum song. That was that's, that that was that was edu- that was very educational. The the one where the the little girl meets the bear in the woods. I, I'm sorry, I'm really bad at remembering titles. Yeah, sure. No, yeah, yeah. So what what I've done now is we said, okay, what worked for Trebies was the music, and a lot of that worked well in the background visuals. What didn't work was that the YouTube algorithm doesn't love puppets, unfortunately. The YouTube, there's no such thing as like a really popular YouTube channel with puppets and animation. This just doesn't exist. But there are many, many. YouTube channels with live action bands, like chill, per, human performers, performing kid songs with animation, and they, who have 30 billion channel views. You know, whether you're talking about D Billions, Bounce Patrol, um, they each have 30 billion uh, streams per channel. Miss Rachel is like 5 billion streams now in the last two years. Um, you know, they, I can go on and on, the Mic Max, the Wiggles, whatever. There's many examples of this on YouTube. So what I decided to do was go, why don't we take the puppets out because the YouTube algorithm basically does won't promote us because it doesn't have any other sites to compare us to. And why don't we replace the puppets with humans? So we cast like four uh, really good, very interesting, engaging children's performers and singers to do all the Trebies songs as humans. So that's coming out in September, and we're, I'm releasing about 220 uploads throughout 24 and 25 over a 12-month period. And uh, I'm hoping it becomes the new Wiggles of North America. It becomes the new children's band, and it's very much meant to um, respect the ears of two-year-olds and one-year-olds and three-year-olds and their parents and not dumb it down to the point where you're just like, what is this garbage? I don't want my kids listening. So yeah, hopefully it, it, I've, bridge the gap. You know, I, I I study psychology on the side as a as a hobby, and uh, something I ran into a while ago was they found that if you baby talk your kids, they actually develop slower. Uh, and I mm-hmm. I couldn't. I'm sorry, I I uh, don't have that on hand. I just remembered it here hearing you talk. But if I can find it later, I'll. I'll put it in there. Um, so yeah, they, they, and that was one thing. Like I had completely given up on television as a medium until, until uh, Friendship is Magic came along. I uh, and uh, I watched it. and I was like, oh, it, these people, these characters actually talk like people, and and uh, the voice acting is believable, and it's a you know uh, good story, things like that. It's not it's not riding my brain. So. I always appreciated that about pretty much the entirety of the Friendship is Magic crew, yourself included, Mr. Ingram, is that, is that you guys di- did respect your audience regardless of, of, of anything. So I think we're on the same page with that. Real quick, before we get into audience participation here, I haven't heard from Goonie in a little bit, so I want to know what you think about sort of what we're, what we're talking about here. Well, uh, from my perspective, I had, um, I didn't, the only children's songs that I listened to personally growing up, you know, uh, was was stuff, you know, from the church. I grew up listening to primary songs and I didn't really have any much interest, you know, in, in songs that would have been that would have been geared for my, uh, uh, you know, my age at the time. But what I did experience was not understanding a lot of the music that I was listening to, like what it was about. Um, and like like the the thing is one of my one of the songs that i really liked listening to because it sounded cool and i i couldn't really understand the lyrics was this was the song centerfold by jay giles band i didn't i didn't understand you know what it was really about but i just liked the beat um did it, did it make your did it make your blood run cold yeah <laughs> <laughs> But Goonie, you probably wouldn't remember the music you were listening to when you were one or two or not, three. Not one or two, no, yeah. no, no. But even, but even still, uh, it was probably around the age four to four or, or eight mm-hmm. or something that I loved that song. Yeah, and, and, I and still that's when kids understand. really will listen to anything. Like after about age four, 
yeah. anything, you know. But it's the problem is that pre age four, that's where like Coco Melon really like shot a bu- <laughs> magic bullet as they realized, oh, younger than that, kids don't necessarily want to listen to more sophisticated music. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it's and that's where it's like oh, and that's when and and there's good examples of good artists doing that music, but yeah, I know what you, when you get older than four, you can kind of like get your kids to listen to anything really. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, uh, does anybody have anything they want to uh, add before we move on to audience participation, or should we get to it? Let's get audience participation. All right. Yeah, I, I made a note of a of a good few here. We got we got some good participation tonight. Uh, so let's uh, rock it through these as fast as possible. See if you guys got any that we missed, and uh, wrap it up. So uh, at the very beginning, uh, Pelled and Pony Two, who's been watching the sh- my show for forever, says, uh, "Does anyone know if Mr. Ingram has done any work for Disney?" So Daniel, you done any work for Disney? Um. I'm trying to think back. I thought really, I think I did one show that was like associated with Dis- Disney somehow. Mm. Um, I think, for example, I did a show called Kate and Mim Mim. I wrote the theme song and a few songs and it was on like Disney Channel. But no, I've never actually like been approached by Disney to do a specific Disney project. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, another question he had was, uh, is it harder to make uh, kids' songs than it is to make songs for teens or adults? Uh, It's kind of like the difference between writing, you know, a poem. If you imagine, like, okay, what you want to write, like, if you want to write, like, a a haiku, (laughs) you know, a haiku can be really hard to do well, or anyone can write a haiku. You know, like as long as you know what the rhyming structure is and this, the, the the rhythm structure is, pretty easy. It can be pretty quick to write like a bad haiku. But I think it's quite hard if you're a, if you're a fan of haikus to write a really good haiku. So that's I would say that uh, children's music when you're writing for young kids can be extremely easy or extremely hard depending on really how uh, good it is. Uh, whereas songs for teenagers and adults, if it's not good, the audience will quickly reject you and you will have a failed song on your hands. <laughs> so, ah. You know, usually the market decides, as they say. Very good. Uh, Clay Curry Art says, hello. I also followed the development of Billy Bust Up and it is certainly making innovative strides. It was uh, something Epic Mickey 3 was going to tackle uh, had Epic Mickey 2 uh, done well in sales. So yeah, we're, uh, that was just saying that was just saying that uh, it wasn't really so much a question as this Clay Curie art uh, gentleman says uh, he really likes what Billy Bustup is trying to do. There was a- yeah, it's going to be groundbreaking. It's going to be really, really cool. And uh, I feel like it's going to be probably one of the most replayable games anyone's played because... You know, like, even with the song we recently released, Dragon's Queen's Cave, there's multiple iterations of that song. And so as you play the game, and you can you can probably go back in and do the song sequences again if you want, they change all the time. So it's very fun to replay and find out how it can change. Um, there, there was uh, something I saw on, uh, on, well, I'm not, like, on TikTok, but it was imported from TikTok where I saw it. But uh, there's a, there's someone out there making a game right now that's sort of like a hack and slash, but with music, and you do uh, you use actual like music theory to compose your song with your button combinations, and that's like your attack combo. And uh, something I learned <laughs> recently is that uh, Devil May Cry is actually technically a rhythm game because uh, you actually uh, can are supposed to the best way to play that game is to time your combos with the beat of the music that's playing in the background and as you start oh. landing more combos the game will actually transition the music to to ramp up and you, and if you follow along you'll get a better combo uh cruiser i think wanted to add something to this yeah i was actually kind of glad uh, what you said daniel about the replayability of this because a lot of games nowadays i feel like are just one and done. You can you play it. You're you get the lulls, and then you're never gonna pick it up again. I mean, I enjoy playing Untitled Goose Game, but I haven't gone back to that game in a long time. 
So Same. I just, yeah, uh, even with something as, I mean, say what you want about Five Nights at Freddy's, but it became an actual franchise. But And you can even get fun out of just watching people play it. So, so I'm glad to find out that it's not that, that Billy Bust Up is not that kind of game. I want something yeah. that's going to be around for a while. I feel like it's going to be very replayable, even if it's just going back in and playing the, the song sequence, battle sequences, and stuff like that. Um, I don't think the game... The game is pr- like 20 hours or 30 hours long. Um, wow. But, uh, you know, so I, don't, I don't know. Like, but, yeah, I think it's going to be one of those games that really does have a cult um, following and that will be able to, like, play for years to come and really enjoy, just because there's just something very dynamic about the ever you know about the the way of you know fighting a battle but with music playing it's like with a not just music but a song playing that you that changes you know i think it's makes it really really quite engaging (laughs) yeah uh my good friend hi-fi rush Mm. or uh jet set radio maybe i don't know that too showing my age here Uh, oh Hi Fi Rush, though, is just, it's very, very rhythm based. You have to play uh, uh, to the rhythm of the song. You have to fight to the rhythm of the song, otherwise right. you, you get hit. Yeah. Right. Dance, dance, so, revolution. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> From yeah. Guitar yeah I mean, there's hero. lots of games like that. I'm just... That's true. There's lots of games where the music is like part of like is the dancing part, but um, it's different in the case of like a, yeah, maybe more like Hi Fi Rush, where it's like a chase sequence and stuff, but. Probably, because each yeah. song is a different type of gameplay, it's um, it's quite interesting. It's not like one formula. Like the formulas changes throughout the, throughout the game. Uh, Willie's in. Good friend of mine says, uh, "Do you find the creative process easier when you are given more specifics, such as storyboard, script, or possible lyrics, or is it easier to have generalizations like uh, character is singing about X or Y in the style of Z?" So, uh, uh, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I, it's, I, I honestly feel like the biggest um, kind of ramp up in the challenge of the creative process isn't so much in the amount of like restrictions I have as much as the scope of the assignment. So if the assignment is like, hey, write a 30 second jingle and here's some stuff. You know, generally, just because it's 30 seconds, you can write, like, a bunch of different versions pretty quick. When it's like, hey, can you write this, like, five-minute-long opus <laughs> that covers this span of story that and write all the lyrics and make it interesting and have it change? Like, when the scope is bigger, that's when the challenge grows. And so, like, with going back to the Dazzlings and their sort of final battle song, which was, like, I don't know, seven minutes long or something... Um, you know, like that was a very challenging song to write because it's just so long and the scope is so big versus like write this ditty that Pinkie Pie sings, you know? And so I, I don't know, I, I feel like getting no instructions might actually be the hardest thing because you're just completely on your own. But getting like some instructions helps get you inspired. There is a point where there's too much instructions and then I'm just, it's more like a machine. You're just like, ah, well, these are the lyrics, this is the style, this is the duration. They tell you everything, and now you just have to, like, basically be, you know, just be the conduit to make that happen for someone. And it really is quite, at that point, it's actually kind of easy, but there's not that much necessarily that satisfying. Very good. Um, Goonie, do you have any thoughts on that real quick? Uh, actually, kind of, yeah. Uh, there, I think that there should be a good balance. I don't have, you know, so much experience in, in, in that regard, but I do have an exper- the experience of working with a lot of musicians who have a specific, um, who have a specific vibe or or even a chord progression or the entire song, you know, the vision for that, you know, in mind. Uh, in particular, I've worked with Meta Joker a lot. Um, Meta Joker is also another uh, Brony musician uh, like me. But he's branched out to a lot of other, a lot of other things, and I've helped him with a bunch of songs by basically putting them, bringing them all to life, because <clears throat> he's a really good songwriter, really good singer. But he sends me, he sends me demos basically of all of his songs, and he just says, "Hey, do what you like with this, with this song. Uh, I want to sing it, and I want to play piano." And he just says, "You, 
do everything else, whatever you want. And, you know, and that's kind of, that's kind of how it works. And we mm -hmm. just kind of, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun process for me because it means I don't have to do any of the writing, you know, but I still get to put together this song that, that, you know, that he sent me, you know, that he sent me the idea for. And it's, I find it personally fun because I love his songwriting and it's, it's always relatable and it's always, it just works like that. You know, just working with other people in their vision is, he's good if you have some specific instructions, but not so much restriction, you know, so as to like limit it down to only the, only to this specific instrument or that specific, you know, vocal mm -hmm. style or, or whatever. As long as you have some creative freedom to do what you like uh, with the song, uh, I, I think that's what works best for me. Mm. Yeah, what you're, what you're talking about, a little, I would classify as like song production, where like yeah, yeah. the song's been written and now you need someone to produce it. Um, and right. they're definitely two different processes, and I, but equally valid and super important to the final product. Um, you know, I always work really closely with song producers because I put so much of my energy into like the lyrics, the melody, the chord changes, the basic style. But the, then when it comes into like, oh, now, to, now I got to actually like produce and mix and make it all like the fine product. That is just as that's like a whole nother step. And that's yeah, where I, mean, I usually that's... give it hand it over to someone who I usually work with, be it like maybe Trevor Hoffman mostly these days. And say, hey, here's the, you know, here's the recorded vocals, here's the chord changes, here's the sheet music, here's the, you know, a couple melody ideas I have for the bass is doing and the drums are doing. But he'll ultimately replace all that with his thing. And that's, and he's talking about what you're doing. Like, he loves not having to think too much about like writing the song, but like working on my thing to take it to the next level. That's kind of what Griffinilla does, does as well. Known for just writing everything and then like handing it off to, to somebody else to produce. Yep. And that's super common. Like even like Lin-Manuel yep. Miranda or like, you know, a lot of say the Disney writers, you know, they would write the song, but the actual like orchestration goes to a team of orchestra. And, and, right. and they don't like, they don't go and necessarily orchestrate every note on the page. You know what I mean? They write the song and then yeah. they work with the team. Uh, right. Drummer Shy says, Daniel, I hope your next project seriously picks up on the old ways of teaching kids. I'm really rooting for you. He also says, uh, uh, he has a question for you. Uh, in doing the music, uh, or no, wait, he has a question for Goonie. Uh, since Daniel is doing the music for Billy Bustup, Goonie, have you ever thought about doing video game music down the road with other uh, VGM artists? Um, I kind of have, I, I've given it thought, but just like, because of the fact that every project that I've worked on so far have, has never come to fruition, <laughs> it's, and there's quite a few of them. There's, there's quite a few of them, you know, uh, there was, there was Ambient White, there was Starved for Light, there was, um, Stonicorn, I think it was called, something like that. I've never Anyways, heard of that one. Um, I know, I know, <laughs> there was a few of them, uh. Uh, some of my proudest works went to those games and I don't know, it's a little discouraging to never see them happen, you know, never see them get finished. After I've, I've been there years. I've, I've been there too, I know exactly what you mean. I was approached by like it, was, it wasn't DreamWorks but it was uh, very similar, another company I won't mention but similar to DreamWorks, big, you know and they, had, they wanted me to write these two demo songs for this like proposed massive budget movie and I just was so excited to work with them that I went and wrote these songs for free, basically, and produced them and paid for that. And they were some of my, be I feel like some of the best songs I've ever written. And then the project was never got off the ground. It's like, mm. well, that was frustrating. Yeah. And so I've been there. I hear, I feel that, you know, all I would say I is- I think I listened to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've been meaning to post it somewhere. Cause I'm like, you know what? They didn't pay me the, they didn't pay for these. They didn't. I didn't sign away the rights, so I still own the songs. I should post these somewhere because they're really epic songs. Um, but uh, it was for something called The King of the Jungle that never happened. Anyways, um, the um, for Imagine Entertainment, actually, is what it was. And so, um, but I will say this, that when Billy Bustup approached me four years ago, they were just in the germs and I, a germination of their project. And um, I was like, this is probably not going to go anywhere. So I just said, well, I figured to myself, I said, well, I'll just make them pay <laughs> enough money 
so that even if it goes nowhere, at least I got paid for my work, you know? And so uh, uh, that's maybe the way to answer that to um, Goonie is like, I was just like, well, as long as you can get a fee that makes you feel like, okay, well, this is still worth my time, regardless of if this project goes anywhere. And when I was doing yeah. Billy Bust Up initially, I, that's what I figured. I, and I kept, you know, a certain number of rights to the music and a, and a fee to make it like, okay, I'll write this song, assuming it would go nowhere. And then it turned out to be something that's going somewhere very fast. So you just never know. I wouldn't give up. I'd have a halfway decent voice acting reel if everything I recorded uh, got released. Uh, just real <laughs> quick, uh, Cosmin Spears said, hi, long time. They'll see how is everybody. I didn't expect to see... Ronnie on a stream tonight. I've been having uh, I've been having some health problems lately, so my schedule my stream schedule has been all over the place. But uh, you will never get rid of me. I am eternal. Uh, so just uh, be ready. Uh, Mangle Muffet says, uh, Brawny Daniel, uh, Goonie and Cruiser. What songs did you listen to while growing up? I'll uh, tackle that real quick. Um, my mother is act was was uh, actually a professional opera singer for a while, so we had a lot of we had a lot of theater music, uh, like especially Les Mis. She loved Les Mis. Um, we had a lot of opera music, uh, that kind of thing. My father uh, was really into was really into classic rock, especially from the seventies and eighties. Uh, loved the Beatles. Loved uh, uh, um, ABBA, Monkeys. Uh, turtles uh, as well things like that there was also a lot of a, a lot of kiss acdc aerosmith uh guns and roses uh so that's what we listened to um uh, when when i was uh younger and then i ended up getting mostly into into uh orchestral and uh i i love um like hybrid orchestrals like uh like red spark or uh or altius volantis or uh ratty arc in the fandom uh, let's, uh, uh, so how about, how about you gentlemen? Daniel, Daniel go first. Sure. I mean, the, the first song I remember being obsessed with as a child was like, uh, Puff the Magic Dragon. <laughs> I remember just jumping on my bed, listening to that song on repeat on a little plastic record player. Um, and then the next music that I got into as I got a little bit older was like parents listened to a lot of like Fleetwood Mac and Bruce Springsteen. I remember being really into Bruce Springsteen um as a kid and uh you know born in the usa and so stuff like that and then um uh and then from the you know but like i'm thinking like from age like six down kind of thing yeah that's sort of my earliest memories of music was was like that mm. and... uh for me the, the the first song that i remember hearing as a kid at least on the radio that i really liked was in the house of stone and light by martin page uh, for those who actually may not know, I actually used to be an altar boy at my church, and my uh, mom would actually turn that song on after church, and I absolutely loved it. And as I got older, it went from that to Hanson, and for some reason, somehow, it went, it went from Hanson to heavy metal. I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Goonie, how about you? Earliest stages of life were definitely church songs for me they were there was this one song called book of mormon stories and man that tune rocked <laughs> it's this <laughs> silliest little thing you play it on piano and kids sing it but it's just it's the cool little coolest little thing that's what i grew up listening to at the earliest stages of my life but uh when i got to like really you know hunker down and pick my pick my own music i really liked uh i love boston you know and kansas and that kind of stuff oldies that you know were way before my time I'm, i was a 90s kid so uh yeah that that's that's kind of what i what i grew up listening to most for the most part was you know what my what my parents liked listening to at the, at the time being huh. so uh clay curiart this will be our last one clay curiart says uh were there for daniel were there any major differences on working between uh friendship is magic and littlest pet shop uh, yeah, totally different uh, in projects. In terms of the genres that you used. Uh, yeah. I... Yeah, so Little, Little's Pet Shop was all about, look, let's not have a sound. You know, let's have, like, let's just have fun and mix genres and write silly, fun stuff in every genre. And so I, the, I think they really tried to mess with me and try to see how, if they could trip me up somehow <laughs> by just, like, giving me, like, these crazy genre mashups. 
Whereas, which was super fun, and I'm very proud of a lot of the songs on Lilith's Pet Shop. Um, I just had so much fun writing in all these different wacky genres and doing goofy stuff. My Little Pony was a lot more like, we have a sound. Like, this is the My Little Pony song sound for the most part. And about 80% of the songs, I would say, fall within that specific uh, approach. Um, and it was a kind of an orchestral, Broadway meets a little bit of synth production, kind of a little bit of a pop influence. Um, and so they were very different in that respect. One was like writing in a style that was like more musical theater and more of a specific, unique sound. Whereas one was just, let's just blow it out with a bunch of fun genres and do funk and do, you know, Michael Jackson, do um, barbershop music, whatever the case may be. I love that ska song you did. That was great. <laughs> Thanks. So much so, fun being fun. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Daniel, let's uh, let's wrap this up. So, tell us real quick about your about your campaign and your future projects, and we'll and we'll get into the we'll get into the last we'll start closing out. Sure, sounds good. Uh, yeah, I mean, like right now, my I'm working on a show called uh, Lego Friends. That's my biggest my big job right now is Lego Friends. It's a big Lego IP. Doing a lot of songs for that and score. But, you know, the other big thing going on is this Billy Bust Up game is coming out next year. We are going to try to record all the songs with the live orchestra. So it sounds like a full-on feature movie quality soundtrack. And release that soundtrack. We're offering a ton of incentives to come and, and help us with the backer kit. It's in the, the chat, I believe, for this. Like on, Sorry, it's in the page on YouTube on the top. Um, uh, description and um yeah we really appreciate anyone even like even one pound gets you something i think so uh five pounds gets you something <laughs> it's all in british pounds i don't know that's just because they're based out of the uk uh so watch out because that's about double i know the canadian dollar uh but the uh i think uh it's, i bought the uh keychain set which looks super cool um but anyone who contributes to that it really helps us because it's an indie it's an indie game it's a really good indie game um, and we just want to have an indie game with a AAA soundtrack, basically. Nice. So, um, yeah, uh, let, and here's the last segment here. We're just going to real quick, cause I know we're pressed for time. Uh, but the most important thing we got to give our uh, final thoughts and one thing you learned. So I'm going to say real quick because mine are, is the same thing. My final thoughts were be genuine with your audience. And we've talked about this a lot in, in past installments of the show. And the conclusion is always be genuine and respectful to your audience. And uh, yeah, so uh, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on and giving me some more confirmation bias. I definitely needed my head to be any bigger. Um, <laughs> how about how about you, sir? Uh, one thing you, uh, if closing thoughts and one thing you learned. Give us a couple sentences. Um, yeah, there's been a lot. <laughs> it was a great conversation. I'm so grateful you came on. Yeah, I thought it was interesting to hear, Goonie, you're talking about how, um, you know, like the frustrations of doing, you know, having f good faith in writing music projects where you don't really know where they're going to go. Uh, you know, I just thought that, like, as much as I felt feel like, oh, I'm never going to do that again. You know, it reminded me that with Billy Bust Up, I didn't think it was going to go anywhere, and it did go. So, uh, you know, just that sometimes, as long as you're doing it for your own reasons, it's worth it's worth doing any project, even if you, you might not uh, end up getting um, as much of a payoff as you would hope. Nice, Goonie. How about you? Oh uh, well, I didn't. I honestly uh, didn't think that there were so many age groups. You know, between like what uh, what music is suited for which age group um or suited best for for which age group and i i that's that's kind of something that i learned and I'm, I'm also just really glad to hear that you know a lot of projects can come to fruition even though even though it may not pay off as much as you'd like it to at least you know things i know that things you know games happen and and, and shows happen and and i just I, i'm just one of the really unfortunate ones who had all nearly all of them just Know that your time is coming soon. As the sun rises, so does the moon. Now, before I break anybody else's oh, ears, before I, before I break anybody else's ears, Cruiser, one thing you learned tonight. 
Uh, yeah, actually came from Daniel when he said that kids respond to energy. And by kids, I mean toddlers. That What they respond to when they're listening to music is the energy. Not so much, uh, uh, like in this case, like if it were like a guitar with a distortion cranked on. No, it's uh, the energy of the rhythm, the beat that's going on. I actually didn't consider that. All right. So, Daniel, thank you so sense. much for coming on again. I was uh, looking forward to this to this conversation, and it was definitely worth the wait. Uh, did you have fun tonight, sir? I did. It was great. and happy to do it again sometime. This, maybe uh, in the fall when uh, my uh, children's music project launches, we can get into that and do another one. I would love that. Absolutely. And, and uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for everything. Uh, Goonie, did you have fun tonight? I had a lot of fun. Yeah, Very I always good. enjoy this. I think this is the third one I've been on. I believe so, awesome. yeah. Uh, and thank you so much for the extra time here. I'm going to let you guys get to your families. Uh, everybody, uh, stay safe. God bless. Have a wonderful Easter. Uh, if you'd like to if you'd like to support my channel, to check out the uh, Patreon links to see what you get in return. But uh, before you do that, make sure you support uh, Daniel's uh, campaign at the very top there. So we will see you next week. Once again, stay safe. God bless. Have a wonderful Easter and say good night, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Good night, guys.